So welcome, welcome. I'm glad to see faces that I know very well because they are from my present on past course. Yes, hello. <laughs> I can't miss you. You're over here, over here, over there. And also friends I have and, and fellow coaches and facilitators. So thank you for being here. And for the people I don't know, I welcome you with the same intent. So we are going to be together for one hour and 10 minutes to talk about how spirituality is actually penetrating the corporate world and businesses. And that's not new, but that becomes more open and more visible. So that's interesting because there starts to be a shift. So we're going to talk about this shift and I'm going to bring you data from the field, data that I have observed thanks to my coaches, so people I've been following for the last six years. And we're going to see together how I, they have been able to impact their organizations and change actually the world around them. I dreamt about this day. You know, in spiritual practices, we talk about conscious dreaming. So I had a conscious dream about today, many times. Um, when Hina offered me to give a master class, um, she asked me that question. And then what happened to me is the answer came from here. It didn't came from, from here. I blurted something. Almost, I was not able to control myself. Actually, I said something even before realizing what I was saying, quite literally. And I said, oh, I want to talk about leadership as a spiritual practice. A bit like that. It came a little bit out of nowhere. And there was, every time I dreamt about this day, there was excitement and there was fear. I had like a thrill. I could feel a thrill in me and anxiety. Huh? And now that I'm here with you, I'm feeling a sense of wonder. It's wonderful to be with you today. It's not random. We are gathering together in that space and time for a reason that maybe we don't know yet. It will unfold in due time. And that's okay. Something I want to say is that in the spiritual training I got, I had a chance to receive, we have a practice which is to um, honor the space we are entering. We don't enter a space with fellow human beings just like that, especially when it's a matter, when it's a conversation that can have some depth, hopefully. So there's a sense of reverence. Uh, there's a little bit of a ritual to enter a space. And that's what we are going to do first. Even before talking about, you know, the content of this presentation or doing anything else, I just want you to take a moment to pay attention to the space we are creating together. And maybe some of you are comfortable closing their eyes, and maybe some of you are just comfortable keeping your eyes open, up to you. But I really want you all to take a moment and embrace the energy of this space, the space we are creating together tonight. And maybe there's a, a word for it that comes to you. I, had, I received wonder for some reason. And maybe you're receiving something else. Maybe there's curiosity or anything. But pay attention to that. As if there was a cocoon or a bubble around us. And maybe you can picture it in your brain. You can see the cocoon and the bubble around us. So we're entering this space. Let's get started. You know my name, I'm Xavier Garcia Weibel, guest faculty, I didn't need to say anything else, Francois covered it. I'm an executive coach and I lead workshops and my workshops are experiential. That means I don't do lectures, that usually is not something I do. The type of format that you have with me today, <laughs> that's not my format usually. I give a little bit of theory, and then I have people practice something. You know, they get the experience of what I'm teaching, of what I am facilitating. I do that with fellow facilitators. They are here, some of them are here. Um, that started in 2012. And before that, I spent 20 years in the IT telecom industry. So I was a manager myself, a director, 
mostly focusing on change and innovation, disruptive things. So I worked in France, I worked in the Silicon Valley, and, and since 2002, I'm based in Switzerland. I, what I, I am, see myself as what I call a field practitioner. I'm not an academic, so I don't have a magical theory to offer you today. But I have plenty of data from the field, as I said before. And I consider myself as an enthusiastic skeptic. So what does that mean? <laughs> so that means that maybe some of you are very skeptical about spirituality and why and how does that relate to the corporate world, you know, how do these two get together. And I'm like you. So every time I go to this spiritual training that I do, every time I go to these retreats, I enter the space of the retreat and then, you know, when the trainer asks me to do something, I always look at it and, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> You know, you ask me to hug a tree, okay, I'm gonna hug a tree, you know, but I don't know where I'm going with this really. Huh? So I trust to a certain point, a certain extent. And the only thing I do is that, what I do though, is that I let go of any belief I might have in myself, any resistance that comes from my brain, and I just dive into the experience. That's what I do. And then, I'm very pragmatic, so what I do is that I look at the result and the effect on me and on people around me. And if that seems to work, then I tend to adopt, you know, what people have taught me, and if I don't see any benefit, then I let that go. Not for me. So this is why. I keep an open mind, and yet, at the same time, I'm a bit skeptical. So far, so good. Ha. Huh. The boy at the window. Who is the boy at the window? And why am I talking about that? I'm talking about this because the boy at the window is me when I was eight years old. I come from the south of France and I was in a house owned by my parents. And one day, it was back in November 1978, I do remember. Um, I basically I was in my bedroom, and I was eight years old, and I was feeling very sad. Actually, the precise adjective would be trapped. I was feeling trapped. I was feeling stuck. And I remember putting my nose on the glass of the window and these French houses from the 70s, we call them pavillon in French, they have these wooden beams, you know, these windows with wooden beams that looks a little bit like this grid over there on that card. It's not really sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and I put my nose on the glass and I looked at the landscape, the landscape, and it was a rainy day. It was a rainy November day. And I felt, this is what came from my brain. I told myself, I will never be able to get out of here. I was eight years old and I was feeling sad not to be able to get out of here. And as soon as I said that, something happened that still to this day I cannot explain. I, for lack of a better word, received or channeled three messages coming from, call it, the universe, the source, transcendence, God, you know, whatever you want to call it. Something that we cannot really touch and see. But for sure it was not coming from my brain. And I received the f three following messages. So the first one was, this is not your home. The second message was, this is not your family. Mm -hmm. And the third message was, you are going to travel the world and work in a different land. And with that last sentence, I received an image. And in my head, I saw a very busy town full of lights and a very busy street. You know, with horns, car horns, a lot of noise, you know, and I just couldn't make sense of anything. 
the sentences stayed with me. So my parents are my biological pa parents. My house was my parents' house, so everything was fine on that side. But I had a, Im implanted something in me, and after growing up, being a teenager, a young adult, I decided to work abroad. I had really the desire to work abroad. And what happened 20 years later was the following. My company, French company, sent me to the United States and I had a business meeting in New York. All right? So I arrived, I land with my plane, check in in my hotel, and the office of that company was on the Avenue of the Americas in New York, in Manhattan. So the hotel was also Avenue of the Americas, so I had to walk down Avenue of the Americas to reach the office. It was around 4 p.m. or something, 4, 5 p.m. So I get out of the hotel, I walk, and at some point, I froze. <laughs> I literally froze because what I saw, so in 1997, almost 20 years later, was actually the image I had received when I was eight years old. That was the same image. As if, for whatever reason, I got lucky enough to have a peak, to have a, you know, a small glimpse at my future that to this day I cannot explain. What I, the, the reason why I'm sharing this story, because I've never shared that story with, I mean, only a few people know that story, so I never shared that story publicly. The reason why I'm sharing that story is for, is for two things. First of all, after that first image I received, I became, I don't know how to call it, like somebody who is very intuitive. So whenever I talk to people, I get feelings, I get words, I get images in my head about them all the time. It's like, you know, when these transistors, you know, they have a frequency, it's like I'm tuning in into the frequency of people and I'm receiving the signal for some reason, you know? So point one. And then, the, the second reason why I'm sharing this story is because that's the moment where I started to believe in spirituality. Because I had, because I had a, a very intimate experience of spirituality within myself through images I could receive through intuition and I just couldn't deny that something was existing. Without that experience, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. So in many ways, today is my spiritual coming out. <laughs> because I've never talked about that publicly. I never advertised myself as a spiritual coach or anything like that. And I decided to lock myself with the future. After this, today, that's something I will advertise publicly from now on. So thank you for being with me. I'm going to share the executive summary of that presentation for the people who have to leave early. So, Spiritual leadership is an evolutionist, evolutionary step from emotional leadership. That's my conclusion after looking at people from the field, and I will explain what it means, that in detail. What's the difference between emotional leader and spiritual leader? Oh, by the way, when I use the term spiritual leader, I'm not talking about gurus, I'm not talking about the Pope, I'm not talking about spiritual masters. I'm talking about leaders who have a spiritual practice. That's what I mean. At the center, the three skills I have observed that the spiritual leaders are demonstrating in the context of business and organizations are the following. They are able to set a very wide context for things to happen. They are able to hold the container and they are not so attached with the outcome of what's happening because they are orchestrating what's happening, so they take the meta view. Point two that they do and they experience, they, exper they have a keen very deep, intimate experience of feeling centered and off-centered, feeling knowing, the knowing and not knowing. So that's what I call ambiguity, and they can stay with that feeling that most of us are fleeing away from because it's very uncomfortable. Spiritual leaders can stay with that. And because they can stay with that, they model something very powerful for the people around them. And the last thing that they're able to do is accessing their intuition and trusting it very widely, very broadly, okay? For the sake of the business. Huh? And we're going to see that with case studies. And on the right side, 
I talk about the three dimensions that basically organizations are, are evolving on when they start being impacted by people like that. So the first one is something that I call the evolution from organization to organization. Organization means that life is basically throwing, throwing in the system. There's life everywhere in the system. That's what it means. It's as if the organization, the business, the group, the division you are in, follows the natural organic flow of things. So there's no need to push that hard as you used to. Huh? The second thing that they do, the second impact they have is mobilization of employees towards good. Uh, we talk about tech for good, we talk about having a positive impact in the world. So it seems like what they embody, what they incarnate, the spiritual leaders mobilize employees and workforce. And the last one that they do is that they're able to think in terms of polarities and integrate what's good and what's bad and do something with both. And we're going to explain what it means later on. All right. Let's explore together, of course. Ah, Mr. Benioff. Do you know Salesforce.com, people? Do you know Salesforce.com? So Salesforce, I mean, if you don't know them, you should. <laughs> so Salesforce.com is the American competitor to SAP. I mean, in Europe, we know SAP quite well. So this company started in 99, and they are a 29 billion, billion, dollar company. Um, they are very present in the CRM back office type of market, you know, in the IT industry. And they are really a giant. Huh? They are a giant as big as, you know, all the giants we know, the Google of this world and all of that. And um, they have also a conference called Dreamforce yeah, that takes place in San Francisco every year. And I checked the figures before coming here. So Dreamforce as an expo has 200,000 people, uh, 200,000 guests. So that means that whenever they throw the conference in November every year, it's not only the conference center of San Francisco is occupied, it's the whole city that becomes Dreamforce. And the whole city is only for, dedicated to Salesforce. So Mark Benioff is very well renowned as a CEO. Huh? And I'm going to share with you, I'm channeling information on my phone. I'm going to share with you what he said, like I'm going to quote him from the interview in the New York Times. So, the journalist from the New York Times, this is what, what he asks him. He asks him, so how did you come up with the idea of Salesforce.com? So stay tuned for the answer. So, listen. First, I went to Hawaii. Nice for a few months, and really, really worked on my meditation practice. Then I went to India for six weeks with a friend of mine who was also going through a similar life transformation. We had these amazing experiences going to all of these different ashrams and meetings, all these different spiritual masters. It was almost like a guru tour. I definitely came back from that trip as a different person. Again, we're talking about the CEO of a $29 billion company, right? So the journalist asked again, how so? You came back as a different person, how so? I came back with a clear vision of what the future of the internet was going to be in regards to software as a service and cloud computing. So listen to that, he went to the ashram met spiritual masters, and he didn't come back, you know, to, you know, start hugging trees again. Huh? That was not the thing. Huh? He came back, and then he had that clear vision about internet as a service and cloud computing, and grounded a company huh, that became highly successful. And he gives a key at the end, after, he says, I also had a much deeper sense of my spiritual self. So I said, when I will start a company, when I start a company, sorry, I will integrate culture with service. And when we're going to look at the case study of Salesforce.com, we will see that's just what he did. And that's what makes the company so successful because everything is aligned with the sense of purpose and community in that company. Absolutely all the time. All right? 
So there is something there. So this is why we are here together. So I'm going to ask you a question. How do you think spirituality show in the workplace? Do you have any ideas? So actually, there are microphones. I'm looking at you. If you want to pass around the microphone, if anybody has a, an answer, like what is spirituality in the workplace? How is, it, how is spirituality expressed in the workplace? Hello. Uh, sense of belonging. Yeah, sense of belonging is one of them. Yeah, common purpose. That's true. Well, without getting into the secular versus mm -hmm. religious yeah. interpretation connotations, yeah, exactly, of we're going to get into that. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Perhaps it's people that are contributing to the common good. Yeah. And uh, acting with benevolence and altruism toward others. Yeah. Yeah. Does that? That's the consequence, eh? by the way. That's not the practice necessarily, but that's the consequence. Yes. Over here. Uh, to me, far. the sense of belonging would be always being part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Yeah, that can be, yeah. being a force of proposition, that's true. Okay. Be being energized by the place. Yes, holding the, the energy of the, the place. The smell yes. of a place. Yeah, very true. Yeah, yeah. It's a set of practices that you may use to connect with, you know, whatever you call it, transcendence, universe, source, and God, which in turn enable a sense of journey of inner transformation. So that's me in the workplace having a sense of spirituality. That's the effect on me. Yeah? That's the first sentence. And then, as some of you said, it's a shared experience of deeper meaning, cause, purpose, and connection to life. Yeah? I don't know how to express it better than that. To the natural flow of things beyond what is defined as part of the business framework, okay? So whatever business framework you are in, we go beyond that because there's a deeper meaning. Eh? In, even if your company is actually showing its mission and its values, it's even much stronger than that because it's a radical, visceral experience. Eh? Here in that presentation, I cover three main ways of expressing spirituality. So the first one is something that most of you, I assume, know, which is mindfulness, meditation. Uh, the second one that is quite becoming more and more common is connection with nature, shamanism. So if you go to Japan, they do that a lot. If you go to Denmark, they do that a lot. <laughs> Scandinavian countries, they do that a lot. Some parts of the United States. Uh, and then religion. So under religion, all the main religions you can imagine, obviously, all the, you know, all the ones that we know. So some of the spiritual practices people shared with me in my coaching roster are the following. So they do regular meditation at work, short meditation, longer meditation, shortest one is three minutes on Calm, an app for the iPhone. Vipassana, they do Vipassana silent retreats. Huh? They do, they go to monasteries. And then for nature and shamanism, they do meditative walks, okay, in the forest. They do something called vision quests that basically send you in nature for one week where you communicate with your environment without any trainer around you. It's just you and nature. And then they do group rituals. So they get into a retreat for one week and then they do all rituals of connection to nature, to the cardinal points, you know, to the elements and all of that. And then for religion, there's obviously prayer and then pilgrimage, El Camino for Jordi coming from Spain. <laughs> and we have, so basically on the right, you can see that all these practices reinforce a sense of daily practices or co and continuous practices versus retreats. So there can be a disruptive experience. So Mark Benioff, before he was talking about the disruptive experience, okay, he goes to India and suddenly something happens to him, okay? They are very transformational. Uh, it's a process of transformation. The first, you know, the, the first two, the religious aspects are removed from everything that is not religious. The religious aspects are taken away. And obviously, the last point is everything that these people bring that into a business context, there is a translation that is required. Uh, even us, you know, coaches, uh, facilitators, we can be trained, you know, on some spiritual techniques. But if I come to a CEO and I say, oh, by the way, you know what, you're going to pray to the sun every morning, that's not going to work, okay? So 
I try not to say that, yeah? but I do bring some practices, and one practice can be just the one we did at the beginning, which is what is the energy in this room? Can you name what you're feeling, sensing in this room? You know, and that's a translation into corporate lingo of what you know you study in spiritual teachings and trainings. Okay. What is spiritual leadership, or what is a, a spiritual leader? What do you think? So a leader who does a spiritual practice, how would you define her or him? Okay, what yes. I would say is that it's a leader that dares to bring spirituality into whatever areas that mm -hmm. is navigating or she is navigating. That's true, that's true. So giving yourself permission to express that part of you. It's true. even more than permission, it's liberty to me. Freedom, yeah, yeah. very good. Thank you for challenging me. I was thinking that I would say that is also someone that can sense the environment and the and how what is going on in the business, not only in terms of the business, but out in, also in the people. Yes. So I think the sensation is. Yes. Important. Yeah. Very true. Thank you. I would say a spiritual leader is probably someone you would like to follow without him ha having to ask you to. Someone who creates uh, such a uh, such a, um, someone who f fulfills its mission in such a way that you really want to belong to to that world without, sure. without any requirement. Yeah, it creates a sense of community and belonging. Yeah. That's true. That's the impact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, I have my own definition. <laughs> so, spiritual leadership happens when human beings are having a love affair with the universe. <laughs> And for that, I have a hand gesture that I'm going to ask you to practice that it took me quite a while to shoot it because imagine me in my living room in front of that damn plant trying to hold my phone and my hand on the other side and it was not so easy to do. So please be aware of the effort. <laughs> so, and you're going to see how masculine I can be sometimes with my hand gestures. <laughs> All right, that's quite something. So actually, I'm going to ask you to do just that, and I'm going to explain to you what this gesture means. Can you please all stand up? Here we go. If you want to be in connection with transcendence, universe, God, whatever, so the source, whatever you want to call it, the, the idea of that gesture is the following. You are going to, with your will, with your heart, with your sense of purpose, imprint something around you. And that's the sense of that gesture. I'm pushing something. And then the universe is throwing me something back and I need to listen. And I'm receiving and catching. And once I'm receiving and catching, I'm going to push again. Can you please do that and have the sensation of that? It's very simple, but it's basically what we keep doing as spiritual leaders. I'm imprinting my will and I'm receiving. Imprinting my will and receiving. And there's really nothing else to it if we know how to do this. Thank you, you can all sit down again. So just to give you a very concrete example. Since 2016, I was trying to buy a house. Actually, a vacation house by the sea. And I was trying and trying and trying and couldn't find the damn house. I was trying near Barcelona, I was trying in France, I was trying in Italy, I tried in many different places. And at some point, I said to myself, you know what, Xavier, you've been doing this. And you don't get the response that you're looking for because you've been trying to push too hard. And then I realized, you know what, I need to let go of that idea of that house. And if it's meant to happen, it will happen to me in due time. And then I started to pause. And I started to listen. And set a strong intention towards the universe to say, I really want to have that house, and I don't know how, and I'm giving up now. I'm not giving up, I'm present, but I'm choosing to stand and not push anymore. And then I received an email with an ad for a house. And I said, oh, it looks good. And I went to the bank, and the bank was saying, okay, and before they used to say, no, that's not okay, your dossier is not okay, but this time they said, oh, that's fine, okay. 
And then I went to the house, and the first time I stepped into the house, felt the energy of the house. Okay, that's it. I'm signing. And it happened in the space of three months. Actually, three weeks to sign, and then three months to close the deal because the bank and all of that. But that was me really doing that, saying, okay, pause. Okay? So spiritual leaders do that very well. They have the sense of that all the time, you know, and that's magical. That's really, really magical. We're going to, yeah, that's more definition and so on. We're not going to spend so much time on this one. That's definition coming from literature. So one of them being from Bob Anderson, who is really the one who created the leadership circle. It's an assessment tool that we use at the Executive MBA at Ecole des Ponts. Um, and then we have also some research of people who try to define it, but that's okay. That's just definitions. Um, and I think you are aligned with these definitions based on the few answers I got. I have a sentence for you. What does this sentence mean? What does it mean? Any idea? We are part of a whole. Yeah. What else? Everything is connected. Yeah. Destiny. Yes. The water. Sorry. Yeah. True. We belong. We belong. I use that sentence whenever I want to talk about purpose. So in my profession, in the coaching profession, something that we do all the time with people is that we ask people, do you know your purpose? Have you found your purpose? Do you know it? Did you find it? You know? Yeah, right? Huh? Yeah. And if not, you're a loser. No, actually, you're not. <laughs> so we keep asking that question. And Something I've realized in spiritual leaders is that that question to them is obsolete. They don't ask themselves that question any longer. Why? Because they are it. They are it every single second. They are their purpose, full alignment. And that's for me the sign, the difference between an emotional leader and a spiritual leader and I'm, and I'm taking one step back. For me, there is a sense of progression be, between someone who is an analytical leader, somebody who solves everything with his, his or her brain, to an emotional leader, which is already great, meaning I tap into my emotions, I tap into my empathy to try to organize things and systems around me, to the next stage, stage which is a spiritual leader, and a spiritual leader has let, really let go of that question of purpose because they embody it every second, and that's beautiful. And that we come then to that things that come from my observation. So both emotional leader and spiritual leaders, they have a commonality, which is they are servant leadership. They want to serve. Uh, and everybody who said before, you know, the sense of service that's very present with both. And they are change agents, they are transformation agents. So to the point that I believe well, when you say leader and transformation, we're talking about the same thing, like it's redundant. If you're a leader, you need to, talk about, you need to say I'm a transformation leader. Actually, you are a leader, by default, you, you bring change, okay? So purpose, I just said it. And dimension, dimension in focus, so as an emotional leader, you focus on yourself and relationships. As a spiritual leader, still with your emotional leader toolbox, you start focusing on community and wholeness. You're one step a bit further. Your skill in focus is energy and no longer empathy. And you serve human beings, that's true, but you also believe in unity. What I mean by that is that some of the leaders would say, when I see you, I don't see any other human being, I see energy. We are sharing energy. You know, we are all Actually, we're all one, you know? I go beyond the sense of separation. The next one is very important. So as an emotional leader, you seek balance. Eh? There's something, you know, we, you know, in my line of work, we talk about finding the center, finding your balance. Eh? As a spiritual leader, you're okay with being in balance and not balance. You're okay to know you're okay not to know. You're okay to be surrounded by people. You are okay to be alone. Huh? 
your choosing. And maybe the most amazing thing is that you can recover from one state to the other. You have the ability to navigate these states, you know. Imagine an organization where change is coming to an organization that is frightening for most people, very, very scary. A spiritual leader can say, look, this is part of the natural state of things. Nature around, around us keep changing. Life around us keeps changing. Well, that's true for us as well, as an organization, as a system. No? An emotional leader is focusing on outcomes. Out of this situation, I want to produce an outcome, and I'm attached to the outcome, in a way. I'm attached to the shape and form of that outcome. As a spiritual leader, that's not what I'm doing. I'm organizing a container and a context for other people to actually play in that field, very spacious field I'm creating, so they can create an outcome. And I'm still the one very present and orchestrating it. Huh? Emotional leaders, they tend to talk in negative and positive, you know, pos that's positive for the organization, that's positive um, feedback, you know, there's a lot of negative positive. Huh? As a spiritual leader, I'm saying, hmm, actually, there's no sense of negative positive. There's just a sense of antagonism. You're bringing a voice that is very different than mine. Wow, that's interesting. How can I combine the two together? Where's the integration? Is there any field between us that we can actually combine between the two? Uh, and that provokes a much richer conversation than saying, oh, you know what? So let's, take, let's make it concrete, that thing, because it's very important. Let's say, I'm all for health and the planet and trees and oxygen and, you know, human beings and animals living in peace. Huh? And then I see a company that I consider, oh, wow, you guys are polluting, you know, the ocean. Oh, you're bad and I'm good. Is there a space between us that we can create to actually go beyond that? a space without judgment that we can integrate, where we can integrate the two, because that starts to become interesting. Then we can have concepts like tech for good and all the things, you know, like that in that, in that segment where a new conversation can happen. And then the last part is, yeah, as an emotional leader, I claim my leadership. But as a spiritual leader, actually, I claim life. I don't need to claim my leadership. I just claim to be of service for life in all situations. Yeah? So, data for the, and the analytical brain in that, in that room. So, my company is called Soltricity.com. I granted it in 2012, but let's say I really started in January 2013. Um, my data sample from today is based on 118 coaches I've followed since 2013 for a duration of coaching between three months and six months, most of them, yeah. okay? In terms of gender split, I have one third of my roster is female, two thirds of my roster is male, and the age bracket is between 35 and 45. In that age range, that's where I get most of my coaches and clients. They are mostly in France and in Switzerland, that's where they live. So I coach them online if they don't live here. And if you look at the country of origin, they're mostly Swiss, French, Germans, Indians, Moroccans, Spaniards, and Americans. A Little bit of Chinese as well. So now let's have a look at their practices. So from some of the sample, I just don't know. That never came up in the conversation between us, so that's NA. Actually, it's a question mark, I don't know. And then some of them agnostic, some of them practice mindfulness on a regular basis, that means at least twice a week. Some of them have shamanistic type of rituals, that means as, at least once a week. And then some of them are religious, you know, Judaism, Islam, Christianism, Buddhism, Hinduism. So 43% of my coaches, they occupy executive positions. So entrepreneurs, so CEOs of startups, executives, executive consultants, CEOs. And then you can see that in the whole sample, 
60% of coaches have a regular spiritual practice versus two thirds of executives who have a regular spiritual practice. So it's sli slightly higher. I'm looking at time. So I think I'm, I'm going to skip what I was supposed to do afterwards because if not, we won't be able to see the whole thing. So I need to skip the practice. And we're going to go here. So at the beginning, I said that spiritual leaders are able to do three things. They set a wide context. They experience centeredness and ambiguity, and they access channeled inner knowing. And I'm going to detail these definitions now. So first, the picture. You know, I put set a wide context. Do you know why I chose that picture? That picture is actually from Brittany, close to my house, my new home. And um, it's a many, you know, one of these stones, erected stones that Celts used to put on the land. And as you can see, there's a Christian cross on top of it. Paf. <laughs> so what did I, you, do you, any idea why I used that picture for the context? Yes, integration of polarities, that's one. And the reason why I chose that picture is because it's very funny when you are in a place like that, it's quite interesting because you're thinking, was there this, does this place have a particular energy? That was the origin was, okay, people used to gather because there was an energy somewhere over there. Or did the energy come up as soon as people decide, someone decided to put a stone in the middle and it became sacred? Or is it because at some point, maybe 1,000 years later or 500 years later, they decided to put a Christian cross you know, on top of it? But when you are there, you can feel something. You know? And the reason why I use this picture is because spiritual leaders, they create that context in a way. They are responsible for creating that context. So my case is actually somebody called Philippe. That's not his real name. I have to keep the anonymity of all my coaches. So he's an academic professor. He's specialized in science. And he does shamanism, a form of shamanism, esotericism. So forest walks, he had also a Vipassana experience. And when we met for the coaching together, he was feeling stuck in midlife crisis. Um, and through his practice and really receiving, what he decided to create was a community around energy and reusable energy. And he came very far from his original you know, environment, which was very academic. And he reached out to artists, philosophers, entrepreneurs, to create a community that would actually together come up with new energy, uh, ideas sorry, around energy for new startups or new uh, fields of research, basically. And they gather regularly. And he is the one holding the container for this conversation. So he's, he has an opinion, but that's not that important. That's not about him. That's about the way people get into the conversation, even holding very different polarities. Huh? So case number one. Case number two is Michael. So Michael is very special. I, he was an executive consultant, extremely high IQ, very mathematical brain. Like, so fast. You can, like, processing data, like, really exceptional. And he had also that part in me. He was a, a very strong Christian. He had prayer and meditation. And there was always a question that come up in the coaching sessions with, with him. That was, what does life slash God want of me? What is it that I'm supposed to do? What's my purpose? That famous question. And he prayed. He activated more prayer in his life. And we terminated the coaching because we were finish, finishing the agreement. And one month after finishing the agreement, he told me, you know, Xavier, I've sold everything. I'm moving to Africa, and I'm going to start setting up an incubator for startups. And that's what I'm going to do, and that's my calling. I found my calling. 
and he created a community of entrepreneurs in record time. And something that he was always anxious about before it was he wanted to control every situation. And he went into that situation not being able to control anything, and yet he could stay with it. So he developed that sense of ambiguity, uh, really being able to stay with the unknown. And from that moment, he felt, like I'm quoting him, in the flow. Now I'm in the flow. He keeps saying that, I am in the flow. Case number three is someone called Maurizio. I love my coaches equally. You know, I love all of them. <laughs> I have a soft spot for him because he's, um, he's quite someone. The, he was the vice president of sales when I met him one year ago. And the company hired me to coach him because they said, you know what? He has a behavior that is not compatible with the values of our company. We're going to fire him. If he doesn't change, you know, like as a coach, you know, I can't promise that he's going to change. Yeah? I can't. But he says, if he doesn't change, we're going to fire him. He's going to be under HR process, and then he will be out. So we started the coaching, and we had very intense conversations to make him realize what he was doing. And at the same time, things were changing in his life. And something that was changing in his life is that he, he bought a house in Mallorca, on the island of Mallorca. And he said, you know, Xavier, I'm realizing my dream because now I have an olive field, a field of olive trees, and I can make my own olive oil, which has been my dream forever. And he told me once, he said, he sent me a picture, and he said, oh, you know what? In the field of my villa, there's this stone. And for some reason, I'm attracted to this stone. And when I got the picture, out of intuition, I told him, oh, that's a power stone. You know, that's the stone that connects you to your power, for some reason. You can channel things when you sit on that stone or when you're near that stone. That stone is actually very important to you. All right. So anyway, he told me that every day when he was in Mallorca, he was going to that stone and sitting on it. And he said, at some point, I started to have the best creative ideas for my business, like Mark Benoff, Benoff for Salesforce. He said, I'm seeing the future of the brand. I'm seeing the future of my product. I'm seeing some things that I think are very important for the business on that stone. And I don't know why, but that's the place. And to continue on that story, one day, the neighbor, one of the neighbors came to see him. And the neighbor is a shepherd, okay? He has sheep, basically. And the shepherd comes to him and says, wow, you bought that villa, you know, that piece of land, it's very beautiful, and you used to know the former owner, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, so they both walk in the land, and the shepherd says, oh, the stone. So what about, I'm so, okay, oh, yeah, well, what about, what's the story of this stone? Well, that's the shepherd's stone. That stone used to be the gathering point of all the shepherds in the area. They used to come here and exchange stories. Talk about the stories of their cattle. Talk about, you know, what happens in their lives. Talk about, you know, the, the news from the continent, anything. But that was the gathering point. We used to, change, to exchange stories here. And my dad used to do that, my granddad used to do that, my great-granddad used to do that. It's well known, it's the shepherd stone. It's on your piece of land. All right. So, energy. Hmm? Came back, realized that he could change his management style, changed completely the product lines in the space of three months, completely rebranded the shops and the stores, led the transformation, started the transformation of his business units, and two weeks ago, he texted me and said he, he was promoted to become the new CEO. And that was really from him coming to, I think, a very strong alignment of who he was, his DNA with his mission, everything in alignment. And he's really a changed man. When you talk to him, I cannot recognize him from who he was and months ago, totally different person. So that's something based on empirical data. 
So 51 coaches out of the total of 118 experienced a significant progression in their career since 2013. You know, I, they send me some news from time to time, or I ask them, you know, where are you right now? Or well, I can see that on LinkedIn as well. So that means they went from being an employee to a manager or being a manager to become a CEO or an executive. And so, or maybe also left their corporate job to start their own company and so on and so on. What is very interesting is that out of 51 coaches, 26% who had the regular spiritual practice experienced a progression. Okay? So only a quarter. But if you look more precisely at the data sample, you will see that people who are already middle managers, for example, who went up to the CEO executive level, level actually out of them is the double. So 52% of these people who had the regular, regular, uh, had the regular spiritual practice sorry, managed to get career progression. So of course, you could tell me it's a, it's a tough claim, right? You could tell me we're out of luck, out of you know, so many reasons, but still. Uh, we can look at it. Maybe there is something when we are in the middle of organization wanting to go up, when we talk about pyramidal organization, there is something about having a spiritual practice that is very, imp that is very, very important. Huh? Now, let's have a look very quickly at the corporate programs for spiritual practices. So, the first one I know, first end, um, it's Roche Pharmaceuticals. They have a mindfulness program for um, all their employees. And they do that in partnership with an app on the iPhone called Healthspa Headspace, that some of you know, maybe. And the three benefits they advertise for their employees is consciousness of work habits, being a conscious leader, being more present to the work, to the job, to your life, having a deeper sense of presence, and the last one is setting strong intentions, being intentional about what you do. Because when you are intentional about what you do, you basically increase your engagement, your loyalty, your performance. So there is actually a business benefit behind that. The second one is a company called Hootsuite. I stumbled upon them because I was searching for symbolism in, corp in the corporate world. Where do symbols appear in corporate world? And that particular company, they are based in um, Vancouver, they have, all their offices are inspired by Native American traditions, so very shamanistic. All the offices have an all or a totem or something, you know, it's everywhere. So they connect you with nature, even being in a building, you're still connected to nature very strongly. So, and they see leaders as, they call them practitioners, they are leaders. So every leader becomes a practitioner, somebody who creates something, somebody who develops something. And the last one that some of you know, I'm sure, the Southwest Airlines, which is the EasyJet of the US, huh? they have a very value-driven top management and they advertise something called the warrior spirit and, the, and, and that spirit. And spirit is something that comes everywhere in their, in their values and basically it brings them resistance to change, resilience to change. So in a market that is very volatile, they bring actually a lot of resilience. Now let's talk about some of the companies where I saw, so the last one on the right, I also got the information first hand, so that's a company called Timberland. You all know Timberland as a brand, I'm sure. And um, one thing I mentioned before was the integration of polarities, and here it goes again. So Timberland, they were led by somebody who has a deep spiritual practice again. And basically what they did is that they decided not to use any more leather that would come from cattle that destroys the Amazonian forest. And there was a much higher cost, you know, for the production then. That was a consequence of that. And however, they decided to change their production in order to honor their values and in order to see how can I still be competitive on the market while still holding the polarity of being good and doing good. So really holding the polarity of making business, making a profit while doing good for the world. And where is the truth in that for us? So that's what I call integration. Salesforce, I mentioned them before, mobilization of employees. Everything that Salesforce does as soon as you are an employee, the day one, 
they don't ask you to look at your job or look at whatever process on your desk. They send you in the field to help the community. That's the first thing you do. You don't even know your colleagues. <laughs> Say, okay, come to us. You spend one afternoon helping the homeless people, you know, helping whatever cause, helping charity. And because of who he is, Mark Benioff, he has developed that sense of community internally with, among employees, with customers, and also being an advocate for groups, uh, having a social impact. So everything is in alignment with the core business. And the example from the left doesn't come from me, but comes from Frédéric Laloux, Reinventing Organizations. It's this famous company called Birdsock. Uh, they are a healthcare company in the Netherlands. And over there, what they have managed to do is to distribute leadership completely and make sure that everything that they do is at the service of helping, living, assisting uh, patients, assist, uh, employees, customers, partners, suppliers, uh, and everything has to do with the corporate, health, employee, health. So they see their organization as a living organism. That's the way they approach their whole organization and processes. And that has been the impact of their top management being also engaged in spiritual practices. I want you to share your stories with me. I am available. You can contact me anytime. If you know leaders who have a spiritual practice in the field, I'm interested in these stories. I want to create a community. I want to be part of a community of people who exchange on these experiences because this is a new wave that is actually penetrating the corporate world. It's super interesting. I believe that the people in this room who are right now in the MBA, executive MBA, that they call Depont and EADA offerings and other schools, but these, these two, they are going to be the ones enabling, unlocking these spiritual components for the sake of performance, for the sake of finding purpose, for the sake of holding a different type of conversation within organizations. So I want to be connected with you as much as I hope you want to be connected with me. So we can change the conversation around spirituality and the business. I'm going to share a sentence that comes from a Catalan friend. Somebody who lives in Girona called Liberto Pereda is the head of the leadership circle in Europe, and he has that sentence that I found absolutely spectacular. Being centered is not a means to an end, it is the end. So you don't do meditation because you want to improve meditation or improve the business. You practice meditation, you're feeling centered because when you do, you are in the flow of life. I want to thank you all for being in that space with me tonight. We've created a beautiful energy together. And my wish for you all is to keep feeling alive and feeling the conversation that you're having with the universe at any moment. That would be the biggest gift you could make to yourself. Thank you for being here.